welcome everyone to our Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass uh, Wisconsin Artists Series. My name is Casey Eihorn. I am the curator of collections and exhibitions here at Bergstrom Mahler Museum of Glass. And we are really excited to welcome tonight uh, two fantastic artists uh, with whom I have had the pleasure of working before as part of a show that we had here at the museum about a year and a half ago, Sharper Edges, Women Working on the Edge of Glass. And those artists are Kristen Teelking. Kristen Teelking is a professor at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. About a, is about an hour and a half away from here to the, the west roughly. And then Lisa Beth Robinson is a professor at East Carolina University in, is that Greenville, North Carolina? It is. Ah, I, I remember. <laughs> I remember. Yeah. So tonight, just to give you a bit of an idea of how our presentation will work out, um, we will first open with a, a couple introductions from our, from our wonderful artists, presenters. They will go into a presentation, which I think you should be able to see on your screen now, the first page of. I do want to encourage you to use the Q&A feature here throughout the presentation to ask questions. And then at the end of the presentation, we will take those questions to the artists and give them an opportunity to answer them live. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to go ahead and give the artists uh, the floor here. Uh, if you would, ladies, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about yourselves and we'll jump into the presentation. Should we jump in since that's part of the presentation? Absolutely. Go into the presentation. <laughs> You're spot on. Lisa Beth, why don't you why don't you start us out? Okay. Thanks for coming tonight. Really happy you could be here with us. Um I get one of the questions people ask us when you have a collaborative team is how did you meet? And so Kristen and I, the, the nutshell, this is a very tiny shell, is uh we met in grad school. And we both deeply admired each other's work. I was working in the art library when Kristen came to tour and see if she wanted to go to the school. And it's this was at UW Madison. And I was so excited. I thought, I have to be friends with this woman, even if she doesn't come to school here. I've got to know her. <laughs> and so it was really great because I was going you know, Kristen got a job like teaching right after grad school because she's so awesome and went was up in point and I was going up there every summer to make paper with a group of, of paper making folks and Kristen would always come play with us, which was awesome. And then I, we were sitting there one year and we're like, why aren't we working together? And so we started having conversations because collaboration begins with a conversation and finding common ground we already respected each other's work and liked being, you know, hanging out with each other. So that's how it began. This is us squirreling around with a really vivid year of paper making. We're not usually so exciting. And I have to say, I'm a complete amateur. I was mostly there to help with the dinner parties and just to do heavy labor. So paper making, you got to do it right. And I made sure that I didn't mess things up. But yeah, the, the, the admiration was uh, mutual. And when I met her in the book library, um, I felt the same way. I, and I was like, wow, if, if there's an artist woman like this at UW-Madison, this is the right place for me. It really was, um, you know, that uh, it, it, we just felt that way. So it, we feel really lucky. And um, we, uh, you know, one of the things that I, was really excited about. I wasn't working in printmaking, but I really love printmaking. And Lisa Beth was doing these incredible pieces with lino cut, like you see on the upper left and artist books that I was so interested in and um, uh, type uh, language, incorporating language into her work. Lisa Beth, do you wanna say anything about these pieces? Um, these are all Lisa Beth's works. Yes, in the last few years, my work has definitely become more outward looking. I would say it's political, mostly focused on the environment, to be honest. Um, the piece on the bottom left is the model. It's Those are inch wide hexagons. And that's the model for the artist book I'm working on right now, which is about colony collapse disorder and the rise of the divine feminine um, and the death of the patriarchy, because that's part of the rise of the divine feminine. But I think where this work and Kristen's work 
can cross over is we both have a deep love of language and we're both interesting and interested in structures. Mine are like inch size and hers are like giant things, but that's where the common ground comes in. So when you see work like this and, you know, Kristen and Bernie also working in making work that connects with the community, I think we're both trying to do the same thing at different scale. What do you, I mean, Kristen, how would you? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think something that drew me to UW Madison and to Lisa Beth's work are the, you know, this idea of artist books. Um, and it's very participatory. It's very tactile. And it's something that you can kind of enter into, like you would a novel that you open up, it all of a sudden transports you to like this other world. And um, Bernie, my husband and my my um, artwork partner for many, many years, who was also in grad school with us. Um, when we do public art, we try to make an experience that you can enter into. And we almost think of these projects as artist books in a way. So there's kind of um, the same kind of level of experience we want people to have when they're interacting with our pieces. And, uh, and language is in all of these. So the one on the upper left, is a book that um, it was actually part of the artist book show at UW yeah. Milwaukee. Um, each tongue is inscribed with words from the regional uh, American Regional Dictionary that was published in Madison. And then the piece on the upper right is from uh, the State Department building in Waukesha. And the puddles have quotes from environmentalists. Um, and there's language from uh, war the suite of uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> that War is Kind, a series of poems, and each uh, piece of armor has uh, poetry on it. Anyway, you get the idea that we both are interested in layering language within our works. And I think the glass, I just want to say a quick thing. I don't see a lot of large scale sculpture that's glass that includes language. And I think, I might be wrong, I, maybe I don't get out enough, but I think for me, that's a draw to the work. Everybody loves the beauty of glass and the intricacies of the craft, but to have content right there and up front to connect with people, I think is really powerful. And I, I always love that your work did that. I still find it absolute, absolutely seductive. <laughs> Thank you, and I, I feel the same. But we, and we know we don't have a ton of time. We could probably talk about any of those for, we get really chatty. So we're gonna try to keep it moving um, and get to the wave work, which is, is why Casey asked us to, um, what, what Casey asked us to talk about. Um, and this is our uh, website. Uh, I hope you guys can see that okay. Um, so this, so we work independently. We each have our own kind of practice. Um, and then we, Lisa Beth and I make work collaboratively. And then a large part of our work is with a collective called Catching a Wave. And we'll put that link in the chat if you guys wanna check out the website. Um, and we're just gonna introduce you to the other members of our group. So You've met us already, but Shona Patterson is a fellow, a research fellow at Brunel University in London. Um, she's a, a marine biologist and shark counter turn activist <laughs> um, and scientist. And Hester White, uh, who works at Marai and um, does pretty much everything involved in our group and um, numerous scientific uh, projects that she's involved with and also all the outreach. Rill, who's um, a social geographer, and she's uh, worked for many years for the Progressive Magazine, and um, now she's also a research fellow at UW-Madison, and Martin, um, who's a research fellow with Marai, and also a coral expert, uh, also marine scientist, and working at the University College uh, in Cork, Ireland. So this is our team. And we do work with satellite people on various projects. Like we're working with a sound person at Brunel University. Um, my husband, Bernie, works on some projects with us. Um, but this is pretty much the core group. Is it lighting? Yeah. So some one of the focuses of our group, partially because of Martin and Shona's background, is working with the Sustainable Development Goals. These are a set of, I believe, 17 goals that were set by the United Nations 
questions for looking forward for the next, I think 20 years, 30 years. And these are goals that we're trying to get all of our countries, hopefully we'll stay in the UN, get all of our countries to address. But for our group to focus, we're interested in the ocean, we're interested in water. So other goals are like um, education and you know making sure everybody gets fed and has somewhere to live. But the life below water, each of these goals breaks down into a set of minor goals. So for us, we're primarily focused on about four of these. And we try, we do have broader goals that we also work with like people and partnerships, but it's the reducing the marine pollution, protecting and restoring the ecosystems, of course, issues about acidification and coastal areas. Um, I, I met Shona because she trained here at ECU in the coastal studies program. And that's where, you know, and then Kristen came on and that's where our conversations, Kristen knew, um, oh my God, real from, <laughs> you know, social stuff, but then became, I know, brain fart, but then it became a, a more working relationship. And these are concerns that affect everyone. And so part of our goal is to try to help people understand that you might be in the middle of the country, but every one of these things affects your quality of life. And out of all the SDG goals, this was ranked lowest. And we find that mystifying because these affect everything, what you breathe, what you eat, where you live, if you still have somewhere to live, if the ocean doesn't rise up and swallow you whole. So everything you do is affected by the life below water. And part of what we wanna do with these waves is increase that knowledge. You want to go or you want me to do this one? You love this one. I do love this one. So <laughs> this is two hours from my house. I am like the luckiest human ever. And so this is the wave tank at the Coastal Studies Institute. Um, real quick, CSI, which is what we call it, which can be really confusing for people who actually watch television, is a research institute that not only does marine and biological research, but they also do research on policy, economics, um, they've got everybody from school kids to open house things. There, there are a lot of really exciting things happening there. So if you are interested in this content, look them up. But Kristen had this brilliant idea. A lot of what we do sometimes, we get together every summer. I go up and live up there for a month and some. And she's like, I just want to capture a wave in glass. So that idea of, hey, what if? is where a lot of our work begins. And I was like, oh, well, I know this guy, you know, and then we start having Skype conversations. And so we wound up getting money for a grant to make that idea happen at CSI. And the guy sitting at the computer is John McCord, who is a freaking genius is what he is, but he works there. And so he's the person that we connected to, to do that project. What you see in the tank are for measuring um, shorelines. They, they use flotation bits. And that's the, the North Carolina coast on a stormy day. Yep. And, uh, you know, this wave tank is just so fun to work with because you can turn on the motor and it can create any kind of wave that you want it to make. Um, and John McCord is, um, his area of specialty, other than all the other research he does and managing this CSI and the outreach, is photogrammetry. So he's a professional photographer and also a deep sea diver. So a lot of the photographs he takes are under the water of uh, marine archaeology. And they use this photogrammetric process where they position the cameras and they have a GPS locator. Um, and all different points around the object they're trying to capture. Uh, and then they link up the, all those points to create a 3D image. Um, it's way more complicated than what I'm explaining, but we love, we were very interested in what his research because we thought, ooh, maybe we could use his expertise to use that kind of multi-point camera um, documentation to capture the three-dimensionality of the wave and to get that moment in time. We really wanted to kind of create a glass object that would be a talking point or a, a high, highlighted part of an installation um, to kind of impress upon people the beauty, the complexity, and the timeliness, like the, the importance of like the time is now to kind of do something about the ocean. So we thought that time element of capturing a moment a very unique moment um, would be really important. And somehow 
Lisa Beth was able to convince John to work with us because, you know, this has never been done before. Photogram photogrammetry is really done uh, mostly with things that are stationary, not clear, not shiny. And he was like, whoa, those are all the things that photogrammetry hates, but he's like, I have to figure it out. Let's do it. And this is something that really gets us excited about collaborating with scientists. Um, new things happen that haven't happened before when you get all these different minds together trying to solve a problem. And John was just so generous with his time and we spent a week there. And uh, Lisbeth, do you wanna explain what we're looking at here? Sure, uh, <laughs> sure. Quickly, I'll, I'll try to get through this quickly. Bernie designed that rig. Um, John drew it out. It looked like an igloo with chicken pox when John drew it and Bernie made it real. So we had just enough money to rent 16 cameras. There are extra parts on there called a photo wizard, you know, and then the timers so that everything could be synchronized and click at the same time because if the cameras, they're synchronized to a thousandth of a second. If those cameras don't go off at the same time, we can't, we'll be missing a piece of that wave. We can't actually have our wave. And so the targets you see on the top right on the floor are actual maritime archeology span targets that they use for measuring shipwrecks. A lot of what John does is with wrecks and he's doing really cool projects like Department of Defense and stuff. But with us, the challenge was, so this rig it, on the bottom right, you can see it's very, um, made us very nervous because these are all rental cameras, but it's <laughs> over the water on, on two by fours. And so everybody was climbing up and down. I think we can, yeah. So what happened is every, John, that writing on the top right, that's John making sure that everything is synchronized. So you can see it like three cameras. I remember number three and number nine were the really bad cameras. <laughs> um, bad. But every time that a photograph was taken, all of those SIM cards had to be taken out. You see Dave, who's the education coordinator up there with Kristen. We had to take them out, pass them down to John, because we're all up on a bridge that goes, a movable bridge that goes over the wave tank. John yeah, without feeds, falling. That was, it was interesting. John feeds them into the camera, and then we see if we have a picture. So the bottom right is just, that's the piston that moves the tank to create the waves. And so one of our challenges, in addition to get every, everything synchronized, was that the cameras didn't want to focus on the surface of the water. They looked for the deepest part. So they were trying, they kept focusing on the bottom of the tank. So we tried all kinds of stuff. We tried like paper confetti. We tried yarn. People were tying yarn nets. There was webbing, like garden webbing. And what finally worked, and I think John came up with this, was sawdust. So we like go zipping down the, the one highway because we're in the Outer Banks, so it's like tourist land. Go to Lowe's, ask them for their sawdust. They think we're nuts because we're basically taking their garbage. They're like, yeah, sure, I'll get, and they just, somebody just like went and got a plastic bag, but we had enough to make it work. So that floated long enough for the cameras to focus on it and capture the image. Uh, you can see John drawing on the left because it took us three tries to figure out where to put the cameras so we could get the right angle on the surface. And then you'll see it in a minute. We did, so after we captured it, we had to print it out 3D. Um, we have two waves. One took 53 hours and one took 72 hours. And the printers kept breaking. The, that's like the crazy pictures on the bottom. Yeah, so so he, I think he ruined a couple of different heads, very expensive parts to the printer. And this was another snafu. So it was just because of so many data points um, you know, I, I don't remember how many he said, but it was just like millions of data points millions. that had to be aligned. And, uh, but we were ecstatic. We don't have a picture of John smiling, but we do have one. It's like the best <laughs> smile ever. We finally got it. We got two different um, sets of data mm -hmm. and we were able to, so this is one of the waves that was printed successfully and then we have a second one and then this is the the resulting glass piece which if some of you uh have went to the show at the Bergstrom you may have seen one there we also had an exhibition at Plymouth last year that had a lot of these at them too um it's real quick what happens is from the plastic you made the silicone off the plastic right right 
And then the, in the silicone, you take a hard wax mold. From the hard wax, you make a plaster investment mold. And then the glass gets put in the plaster and then it goes into the kiln. So it's a multi-step process. All of this is like million step process. And then lots of polishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times where the technology fell short, just good old being a human being stepped in. So the pictures on the top left are the, the piston. The piston can only make even waves, which is great, but you don't get a lot of resistance. Everything's uniform, like where Kristen's cursor is. We could only get a five centimeter wave. So they gave us boogie boards and told us to get in a tank and, and push. We sat on the bridge, but we provided the resistance. So just being human is part of the experience. And then we were lucky enough to have like one day left. And so we went, we took the whole rig because we are crazy people outside. This is like $64,000 in camera equipment, but we really wanted to apply it in a practical way. Oh, we got a little frozen there. <laughs> Whoop. Okay, I think we're good. Kind of, yeah, I've never used a boogie board except for that. But I'm young. There's time. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, being at CSI and having access to all their technology was really fantastic and their brains. Um, but one of the things we realized through this whole process is that you know, everything we do is technology, uh, you know, the mold making, the, we did some waves that were hot glass in North Carolina, we did some sand casting, here's an example on the left, then we tried, you know, casting some of Lisa Beth's uh, lino cut uh, blocks, which you see here. Um, and all these, you know, these are ancient technologies. And those of you who know about glass blowing, you know that it's a very, you know, it's, it goes way back there. Um, but combining the two different, uh, you know, the ancient and the new technologies has been really exciting for us and interesting. Um, capitalizing on both and, um, you know, producing these things that you wouldn't ordinarily uh, fit together. This is us uh, filling some molds with glass um, after we had cast some Lionel block reliefs. I think we showed those at the Bergstrom as well uh, for one of the shows. Um, and then these are some close-up pictures of the actual waves that we, we created. And, and one of the things that we're really trying to do is embed information about the ocean into the waves themselves so that we kind of get across that idea that you know, these beaut that, that the ocean, you know, we think about the ocean, we think about going to the ocean and playing in the waves, but we don't think about the complexity, the science behind, you know, the salinity levels, the mile long uh, waves that are underneath, uh, you know, mile underneath the water that happen. Um, you know, the culpopods that are absorbing CO2 in the atmosphere. There are so many, uh, you know, different aspects of the ocean that we want to kind of help uh, disseminate and, and share with people so that there's, you know, more of an appreciation for how complex yeah. it is. So, you know, obviously we can't translate, you know, a lot of information through the imagery that we embed. Um, so we're, we're kind of, we play with um, incorporating imagery through silkscreen techniques into the pieces with some maps and other images. And, um, and then we're using those as part of larger installations, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, another thing that we uh, decided to do was to create, we, because we want access to this work, we want to use it as a communication tool, we decided um, to cut the waves into segments like you would a brownie pan so that people, we could possibly get these waves into people's hands so they start to think about the ocean just because they have it in their hand, they're holding a piece of ocean, they might put it up on their desk and think about it every day. It might change their mind about, you know, wasting water or maybe some other aspect of sustainability, just as a reminder, a little beautiful reminder of that we should be thinking about this. Um, and it's also, you know, a talis yeah, it's a talisman of community, right? We are all connected in the same way that every, there is not such a thing as an independent wave. We've isolated in glass, but really every wave is a, a companion to the wave that comes before it and the wave that follows it. 
And that's a good picture of how we want people to think about how they're interacting with the ocean. There are people who are trying to, you know, own the ocean. You can't, you can, you might be able to make your laws, but ultimately the ocean is for everyone. It belongs to all of us. It's a part of all of us. We're all made of massive amounts of water. And so if we can remember these connections, I think that it's a good beginning. So do you want to, Talk about this one or? Well, and just really feeding cool. off of Lisa Beth's uh, comment about community and connectivity, that's exactly what we want to impress upon um, our audience with this project. So those little waves get disseminated around the world and we're just starting to collect back the images of um, the people who we've given waves to. Um, and we want to create this virtual installation on our website and hopefully down the line, we want to print these out really beautifully and just paper a gallery space with it or maybe even a public, you know, billboards. I mean, they can, they're very versatile, these kinds of installations, but to impress upon our audience that this, this is like, we are all involved in this installation. So here's just an example of you know, we have Ireland, uh, Wisconsin, we have New York, um, we have Australia, but we're hoping to- North Carolina. What, what? North Kakalaki is on there. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, right. So, um, but just, we're hoping to get, you know, someone from every country. Yeah. Lisa Beth, did you have anything to add about the planetary I wave? I remember what's next. I, I think I want to keep going because I want to talk about yeah, I do want to talk about this stuff really fast, but I also want to talk about why glass is, is the medium that we're working in. Because you, between the two of us, we could work in almost any medium. Um, there's something really important about the layering, like Kristen said, and the translucency and also the connection with the body. When we look at this, we're using a solid to represent a state change. We're using a solid to represent a liquid. And it's same connects with our bodies right we're solids but really we're liquid and there's something I don't know we haven't really um kind of verbalized it so much yet but there's something very unconscious happening that makes a person connect with glass there's something for me I, I think we agree on this that there's a biological unconscious connection between a human body and glass not well, and it's this it's, magical material, yeah. you know, it's an amorphous solid. It's not a liquid, it's not a solid. Um, and, you know, this idea of a state change, you know, we, we, we like that association of, you know, almost like this, this, this material is kind of frozen, like this, this preciousness, it has an aura to it that it, and just like the water moving it, it, it's only in one specific shape for one specific moment. And uh, we see a lot of kind of metaphorical associations that we can tap into with this art and the glass, um, you know, it draws the viewer in, in a way that other materials don't. And Lisa, that's right. We could work in anything. You know, I weld, we, we, we cast bronze, we yeah, work paper, in paper, printing. we do all these yeah. things. But glass has a kind of a depth and an aura about it that the other materials um, don't have for this particular subject. And it, it's liberate, for me, it's a liberation from the surface of paper. And I love paper, I make paper, but glass lets me do things that I can't do in paper and communicate things that I can communicate with language, but there's so much required of a viewer where with glass, it, it is seductive, but it's also just so tranquil and beautiful. And it, it seduces you in a way that it, paper is just a different, kind of seduction. So we get around. Um, <laughs> we like to go, <laughs> this is with the collective, but what's great about working in the collective is that we wind up going to not just art conferences. This was mostly a sociological conference, economic, economists, excuse me, economics. But they wanted us to be part of it because we talk about the global goals. We talk about glass as an access to paying attention, really. Um, in that audience that you see there, we had everybody from biologists to the, one of the most verbal people was a priest. Oh I yeah, right, right. And they, what they wanted to know was how do we, how do we connect with people? We've got all this great science, but it's not getting out there. We don't 
And I can tell you from going to some of these conferences, they don't communicate as well as the artists do. Um, it's yeah, there's really something sobering. <laughs> the science, why, why Shona and um, and Hester and Martin really kind of talked to us in the beginning about this is that they're, they're, the problem is getting the word out, get, help it, trying to resonate with the public, the issues that are happening with climate change and uh, sea level rise and ocean health, they weren't getting through. And they had seen some examples of some artists really kind of getting the information to people at a different level to really help people feel what's going on. So that is really what we're trying to do here. And that's another reason why glass is so great because it does elicit this kind of emotional response and this kind of wonder and awe that we're, we're looking for. So this is, um, you can see that the installations are now evolving. Um, so Bernie made all these plinths and inside are speakers that um, are now uh, transmitting the voices of the scientists and also children um, and other folks who are and people who live on the coast who are being really affected by sea level rise sharing their stories um, through this installation. So this is just a sample but the idea is to fill a room with these plinths and have the light be going up and down and and as you walk through the voices are surrounding you and almost like a living part of the ocean. And again, kind of impressing upon us that as we walk through, we're part of that ocean and the voices are part of us. Uh, we also are wanting that, you know, that all the waves have a QR code on the bottom uh, or we would like them to, so that when, if someone's carrying it around in their purse and someone asks a question, it's accessing, if you scan that QR code, it will take you right to, um, our website, which has, you know, is tracking all of the projects and information, any research we want to share. Um, and we also like that idea of, you know, that glass is, is like this really kind of um, elemental material, like old, right? We, you know, you've seen like coming out of, you know, lightning hitting the beach, right? It happens naturally, but to have it link with this like computer um, is, is just kind of like a contrast that we really like. So you can see the um, sound equipment down here um, that we're working with. And then that's the picture of our team when we were in at Trinity. Um, and then here are some examples of different iterations that we're working towards. So here's the group um, where people are walking through, they'll see the sound. We're hoping that as they walk through, they'll trigger the sound. Um, we're still working on that technology. And then these are, um, how the the coast and the um, outer banks has eroded over time we have a timeline they've been tracking it from um actually the 1800s until current so john's part of that research so we would include that map in the space so that it would feel like we were part of the people in in the installation were, were part of this kind of history that's happening the other so, part of oh go ahead lisa beth Oh, she Quick. Froze. So ideally, as this exhibition travels, am I frozen? You good? No, you're good now. As this exhibition, okay, as the exhibition travels, what we'd like to do is take data and voices from that location so that it's being presented from within the community to the larger community. So it's, it's malleable to a point. The glass will be consistent, although we've also talked about making it with, um, with context of the communities that we're going to, like, can we make the glass for that community? You know, what we've got right now is we're still way at the beginning of this project, but this is a long-term expectation. And then you know, I love Kristen's beautiful drawings of taking these plinths and putting them just out in public where people interact, because that's another way. Glass can also be something that's hard to distribute. So if there's a way to make it public, Hopefully it won't get stolen. And if it does, well, then everybody loves your art. But um, ideally, these would just be out in public in places you don't expect to be thinking about the ocean, but you might once you see it there. So what is, why, you know, why am I thinking about the ocean when I go to the pub? Why am I thinking about the ocean when I'm in the fire lane? Stuff like that. Or getting um, your gas it, or yeah. in the bathroom. Or, yeah, it's easy you know, to on an island. We were in Ireland, so people there are much more conscious of the ocean. Yep. Or maybe, you know, in a spe specific community where there might be an underground river that nobody knows about. What if, what if the plinths were, you know, aligned along that underground river? So there's an opportunity for us to kind of uh, 
relate the installation specifically to the communities that we want to bring it to. And also to, um, you know, the next thing we're working on is trying to get the installation to be accepted into the, the next um, UN large conference that's dealing with environmental issues. Um, and uh, to, to get the installation in front of the policymakers. So who is your audience? We want, we want it in the subways, but we also want it in front of people who are gonna be making, uh, making the laws and influencing, in, in, influencing um, those kinds of um, you know, uh, laws and <laughs> yeah. other rules and things. Um, so this is, um, Lisa Beth, you may want to talk about this one. Um, this is another iteration that we're working on. So you see the elements, you know, that we've already shown where the, sea, the shore is changing, there's a timeline. Um, what these will be ideally when we make them, because we're in the process of learning the technology to make these. Um, these will take the same wave files. Ideally, we'll also get a giant grant and go out in the ocean. This is what John wants is to get out in a boat on the ocean. We want it to, the technology is kind of what's holding us up right now. Partially the cameras, partially we're going to need like a giant generator so that we don't have voltage drops when we're out, you know, out at sea. Um, the world technology is starting to help us. I just saw a report two weeks ago that they have internet out on the ocean now in certain parts, mm -hmm. so that will be helpful for us. But what we want to do is make four to eight foot waves that it are a immersive installation. Well said, Kristen, <laughs> that you, <walk laughs> you did it. So what happens is you walk through these waves, they're glass. So there's going to be stuff embedded in the glass, but we also talked about having almost, pardon the pun, but like a watermark in the glass so that when the light comes down, the text and imagery can also be projected onto the floor. And onto the people as they start to walk under right. the glass so that you're literally in the ocean. So you ex physically experience sea level rise by having the water overtake you. And it would be like a dark with very specific lighting. So what we're doing now is learning um, Rhino, which is a 3D modeling program. We're gonna, we're trying to see if we can take the, I think they're SML files to the CNC router to carve industrial material so that we, of the wave. So it'd be like having that wave print out, but in a four by eight sheet. And then we make the plaster off of that sheet. So now another thing we're looking for is a giant kiln. So if anybody knows where there's like a, a giant kiln that can accommodate a four by eight foot plaster mold, which is probably a little bigger than four by eight feet, let us know, please. Yeah, we're thinking Corning, Tacoma, or Wet Dog, but we've got to we've got to get the, the the foam carved. Oh, I didn't realize we were almost. Yeah, done. we're done. Well, we've talked a lot. You've been great. <laughs> we talked too like, much, Casey. We're excited. We're excited. You certainly didn't talk too much, and uh, you know, I I think, and I probably speak for a lot of the participants here that this seems to be, you know, an amazing project and an amazing group of projects that that y'all are working on and and to hear you speak with the enthusiasm for the project you know i think is you know it inspires me to to think more about the project and and i think ultimately that that is your goal as i as i kind of took it you know chatting with you before our conversation today and then as part of of the presentation is to you know inspire greater appreciation and ultimately you know activism for climate change um, mm -hmm. and I, I think that you know it, it seems to me like the purpose of these installations are really to inform the public about global warming uh, about general ocean health um, through the beauty and the mystery that is glass art uh, and you know what better way to do that than you know to, to, to create these installations it, it's it's interesting to me that you mentioned size as being a challenge for for trying to cast some of these larger pieces because um, that was exactly what I was thinking when when you mentioned it. So I do hope that that's a hurdle that you're able to able to cross um, and and hopefully that that works out to where you can. Uh, we do we've had one question come through the uh, the Q and A, uh, but I do want to give some folks an opportunity. You know, if you if you still have questions. Um, for, for Kristen Teal King or Lisa Beth Robinson here, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A because we still have you know, plenty of time for this 
Uh, so think of your questions. I'll go ahead and, uh, and read Mary Ellen Vixta's uh, comment here. Um, so she says, so one way that you can talk about this is that instead of looking at ads for consumer goods, your art on the plinth allows us all to experience the ocean instead. Wait, so, so and the question is, it's kind of a suggestion and a question. Right. I think it's, um, I think it's a really interesting idea. What, what happens when we bring, it, it's similar. What, what happens when you bring the ocean into the, the daily experience? Mm -hmm. Like Mary Ellen, I'd be interested in hearing more and feel free to, I think you have to turn your mute off, but what you're envisioning when you say that, because it sounds to me like you have a, uh, an idea or like a picture in your head. Um, can we let Mary Ellen speak? Yeah, that's I'm I'm going to do that here. She didn't realize that she was going to get to. I know. Questions, should we do Let's wanna... continue with a couple other questions here and then I'll figure out how to get Mary Ellen on. Um, Ann Senfield asks about how you're planning to distribute the smaller wave pieces. So so we've distributed yeah, them at the conferences. We have a card. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we we um, we've given them to people who are interested in the project. Um, it, we if we can raise money to pay for the cost, we've been kind of donating the materials and the time and everything, um, and because you know it's part of our practice. But we've disseminated them to scientists uh, at the conferences who've then gone to their home countries. We've given them to friends. Um, we've, uh, we've given them to young people who've been involved or at our lectures. We're participating in GirlCon, uh, which is a conference for girls and technology in Chicago. So we're going to be giving them to the, um, the, uh, the girls who organized it. We're also selling them. We're selling them right now through Plymouth and the Hidden Studio Tours. And then the money goes right back into buying more materials to make them. So it's kind of a a zero sum game. But if you're interested at this early stages, um, you're interested in receiving one, the only thing we require is that you um, send us a selfie of yourself in the place that you live, could be outside or inside, with the wave. So we can start to keep going with our, um, our virtual installation. So you would have to agree to be part of that. Um, and uh, you know we, we may run out of money uh, to make them, but we try to make them as much as we can with uh, as much scrap as we have. So if you, you want, maybe, I don't know, Casey, I don't wanna make you broker this, but if you wanna contact us either through our website or you know, if there's a way to get your information, like your address to us, we are big fans of snail mail and would be happy to send a, send a little, we call them wavelets. We'd be happy to send one your way. Yep. And uh, you can also contact us through our website, Catching a Wave, and we're collecting, you know, uh, people's contact information if, if that's uh, okay with you guys. And then we'll be letting you know about events that we're involved in. Um, the other thing we're trying to do is connect with universities and high schools and teach the students how to make them while we're kind of um, sharing these ideas because we really feel like the most important people who get involved are this next generation because they're the ones who are going to be making the big difference. So we had a commitment to teach this workshop and how to make them um, at St. Lawrence University in New York. But with COVID, um, we're delaying that a year. But Same the idea this. is to yeah. start doing that so that the students know how to make them and then they can start making more. Um, and they're coming, those little wavelets are going to be coming from their communities. And that way we can expand production because this isn't about us as master glass workers. We want to <laughs> teach people how to make them so there can be more in the world. Um, another thing we've also talked about is a project we've got almost at the table is making an artist book with glass covers. So taking the waves and slicing them and then just having some content because, um, Galleries are really good at getting that stuff into collections and it's unique enough. There's, there aren't a lot of glass books, mostly because of some of the limitations of the medium, but we figured out a way to do it. So that's, that's going to be happening next summer when I come up there. And then, um, oh yeah, this reminds me of, um, so a <laughs> colleague, a music colleague of Shona's yeah. at Cornell University is a composer and he was really interested in the data points and he turned scientific data points into music. 
Um, so we're, John is kind of helping him by giving him the, um, the data that we collected on the computer. And then I did an analog version where I sliced the wave into really thin slices in order. And then I traced them for him. So they would have like the exact curvature of all the parts of the wave. And then he's working on somehow turning those lines into um, a piece of music. But we haven't heard back from, you know, we don't know where he's at with that. <laughs> Everything's on, on sort of slow-mo with COVID. It's yeah. amazing what can be done with, uh, with technology. Could you imagine that we could have done this even you know, 15 or 20. 20 oh my gosh, no. I, I do want to give, a, I want to give Mary Ellen a chance to maybe uh, to uh, just ask her question or, or verify or clarify what she was talking about. So Mary Ellen, if, uh, if you're still here, I'm just going to give you permission to talk here to ask your question. Okay, so uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, so what struck me as you were talking about um, the planks and having them in different locations along with the, the glass art and, and sounds is that um, it creates consciousness uh, wherever you are. And so I, I liken that to um, the fact that we have ads everywhere in our lives right now. Oh, I see. So what, so what you're doing with your art uh, with your installation art is is creating an awareness of the ocean and climate change um, instead of having our world um, inundated with with advertising for consumer products oh yeah beautifully said we're we might have to borrow that for our artist statement mary ellen <laughs> absolutely feel free Thank you. One of my fantasies is to have a billboard of the artwork because I know um, a lot of communities have billboards where they just take artists work and kind of put it up at that large scale. I know it's a little different than what you're talking about, but wouldn't you love to be driving down the freeway and see a picture of the ocean instead of not like a sunset that's cheesy, but like something different. With glass in the ocean instead of another crappy typographic nightmare of an ad. I think that'd be amazing. I saw that Jan had a question about the glass that we're using. And yes, these oh. are all made with bullseye. Um, however, we are very interested in um, doing a series of recycled waves, you know, always thinking about sustainability. But right now, a lot of the waves, um, we've bought new glass, but we try to recycle all of the glass that we've used for other projects too. Um, I think she's also suggesting to check with Bullseye for the kiln, the giant. Oh, oh, kiln. right, right. Yes, yes. Good idea, Jan. Idea. Um, I've also wondered if Kohler, I know they have like three-story kilns there, but that we're going to probably try to go with people who are already working with glass first, just to make fewer technological impediments. I think and Kohler, that Kohler does work with glass, but I'm not sure to the to the scale um that you're that you're looking for with with regards yeah. you know, primarily they're they're focused on the metal and the pottery uh, yeah uh, although we we could give the bathtubs a good run for their money you know, <laughs> while they're enameling um uh, we do have a couple other questions i want the good ones too answer. so taylor asks um for those of us living in the midwest where would you suggest people start um to to work to conserving and protecting oceans from afar. Uh, you know, we have Lake Michigan in our backyard here, but, you know, the big oceans are, you know, several thousand or, you know, at least a thousand miles away from us. So what is it that we can do? Uh, she mentions, you know, reducing plastics and recycling being important, but what else is there that we well, can Well, um, so there's a huge movement right now um, to preserve water quality, groundwater quality, especially wa water that's impacted from, um, you know, agriculture and other industries, like especially in Wisconsin, I know that's going on a lot. And the, also these, the issues with the high capacity wells and how, um, you know, a lot of those restrictions were taken away. So a lot of people started, you know, installing those high capacity wells um, as fast as they could before new restrictions were put in. Um, and so we're going to be dealing with the fallout from that for a while. But right now, this movement, um, get involved, find out who's in your community, who's writing letters. Um, I know we have a group who's doing well testing. They wrote a grant. Um, so the more people 
on the ground who are writing to their representatives and getting involved in whatever group is local who's dealing with water quality because all that goes back to the the ocean it's so interesting like uh i think one of the, lisa who was showing at the sharper image um show lisa um cook uh was saying her piece she made a piece about one water drop droplet was could have been breathed in by julius caesar and we it just gets recycled right so we might be breathing in that water droplet from julius caesar and hopefully he didn't have covid you know at the time but but <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's all connected. So that would be my suggestion for getting involved um, because it's a little more, I mean, yes, plastic, try to reduce your use of plastic, um, you know, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, Lisa Beth, you had something. Oh, sorry. I also think you need to think about what you're doing with the earth, uh, literally the dirt, what's going into the dirt. It's what Kristen said, everything we eat everything we put into the earth onto the earth goes right back to the ocean so all those people you know who are using roundup it's not just about the bees it's about that's what goes into your food whatever you put in the dirt goes into your food so if you can and it's hard to because it can be really expensive but make better food choices think about what you're doing when you're gardening um you don't every second breath comes from the ocean so anything with air quality it's really in some ways, it's really about having that larger consciousness of that we're not just these, the earth isn't there for us to pillage, it's a companion. And when you start thinking about the natural world as an entity and a companion rather than a resource, it's hard to change that thinking, but once it clicks, it clicks really well and thoroughly. And you see these, you know, they might not process and interact the way that we're used to interacting between ourselves, but everything on this planet is sentient and it to some degree so if you think about how each affects the other i think it makes you a little more aware and you make different choices we also have some big elections coming up yes so who candidate yes. candidates are supporting you know environmental improvements um that's so important because it doesn't matter what your politics are or what you believe in you know if 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 your water is contaminated um it just doesn't so well. life anymore so find out who's representing you that's that's um has the environment as a priority who's looking out for you and your yep. kids we just found out that a that a field down by us is um receiving waste from appleton i'm sorry mm -hmm. someone's from appleton i think it was mary ellen and um because i guess you know they need a place to dump it and if you know that waste is for cow feed then they permit it but in that waste is um you know pharmaceuticals and human waste they've tested it and it's surrounding all these you know where people are living and their children are playing and then that's all going into the water plus um, people who are drinking the milk from the cows or eating that meat, you know, all those waste products will be going. I mean, it's pretty interesting and uh, very disturbing when you start to dig a little. So I would say educate yourselves first and then figure out where you fit in. It can be overwhelming, but everybody has a little part that they can play. Yeah, it, it's really the tiny actions are what add up to the larger actions. It's too much to do all at once. It's you, you go home crying in your, you know, in your pillow if you take this all on at once. But if you just find like two or three small things each person can do, we will make the positive change. I, I totally believe that. Well, that and that brings up uh, Sarah's question here, uh, particularly with regard to uh, catching a wave. Uh, what can we do to help the Catching a Wave Collective uh, move forward with their efforts? Woo! <laughs> we love that question. Um, well, I definitely can think of a million things. Um, but, you know, if, if you want to uh, donate to um, buy a wave, then we can put that money towards more waves. Um, if you have any connections um, with spaces that we might exhibit these pieces, and that could be a public space like the Library of Congress, or like if you know anybody who you think might really be interested in this installation in their community and you can connect us with them um, or funding sources. What's exciting is that a lot of foundations are really interested 
in um, the environment now. Like we are finally getting traction on um, people paying attention. So it's a great time to write grants, but it always helps to have a connection with the foundation um, that you're writing to. So we're, we're all really good writers, um, but we're looking for more ideas. Um, like for one, for one example, um, the London Lottery, um, we've made kind of a nice connection with them for a piece maybe in the UK. But any, any ideas like that are really, um, really helpful. Lisa Beth, I do. Um, think of I, yeah, ideas for how we might reach outside of the arts. Also like, lar like larger funding sources or other groups because each of us only has a certain circle of knowledge and each of you have a much broader and different circle of knowledge. So we're, we're really open and interested. I know there are probably hundreds of foundations that we just don't know about and any information and also just ideas would be helpful too. So another thing we're collecting right now are voices. So um, yeah. if you're interested in being part of the voice project, it, a lot like, um, uh, oh, I'm just like blanking on the name of it, StoryCorps. So yeah. uh, those of you might, some of you might be familiar with how beautiful that project is. We're kind of trying to create a StoryCorps core version of information, both just personal about your connection with the water, if you're a poet, or um, I know we have at least one poet in this crowd, Julie. Um, or um, if you have a scientist friend who is working with water and it doesn't have to just be the ocean, but who might be willing to kind of explain their research to us and possibly be a voice in the voice installation. Um, you know, we would love those kinds of connections too. Um, schools like high schools or elementary schools who might be willing to, um, you know, uh, well, I know it's different with the COVID, but um, be, connected with us? Would they be interested in doing a project with us or having us come and speak? That's also something that we're intrigued with. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I, you know, and we're certainly happy to, to play a part in this here at Bergstrom Mahler Museum of Class as well. And, um, you know, I, I certainly look forward to chatting with the both of you uh, about how we can help advance this project as well. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our time today, um, but I did, uh, Kelly asked a great question here, and so I just wanted to, to pose this to you before we wrap. Um, and that's, what is one takeaway you want folks to remember uh, most about today's conversation and maybe the project as a whole? Do you want me to go first? Yeah. I think the thing, to take away is that glass is for everyone. And it can be, it's as fluid a medium as you want it to be and it can say whatever you want it to say. It's magic, glass is magic. And it's a great way to talk about the world around us because it's part of the world around us. Mm -hmm. And I would say in this time of, uh, we're in a very tumultuous time right now, um, socially, um, a lot of social injustice happening and I think the ocean is also a good reminder, you know, again, we are connected. We're connected with each other, regardless of what you look like um, or where you came from. And we need to help each other and stick together. Great. Well, we are super appreciative of you being able to participate in this program tonight. Uh, this was absolutely wonderful. It is being recorded and will be made available um, on the Information Superhighway, hopefully by tomorrow. Uh, a special thanks goes out to the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass. Uh, this program would not have been possible without um, their funding. Um, and so I greatly appreciate that. Uh, just to, to let everyone know, we are continuing with the AACG Wisconsin Artist Series. And our next presentation is scheduled for the end of August, the 27th of August at six o'clock. And that will be with uh, Door County artist, Stephanie Trenchard. Oh, and she's so good. A, she is fantastic. <laughs> and we'll be doing another Zoom presentation with Stephanie. So hopefully you have an opportunity uh, to participate. Again, uh, Lisa Beth, Kristen, thank you so much for coming on tonight and talking to us about this amazing project. And uh, I know that from, from all of us here at Bergstrom Mahler Museum class. Thank you very much for what you're doing. 
Um, and I look forward to seeing uh, more work from the both of you here shortly. Thank You've you. It's been a pleasure to work it. with Casey. Yeah, you're been, great. You know, and yeah, Bergstrom has been really fantastic with supporting artists. Um, you know, we're just, we couldn't be uh, more pleased to work with you on this, really. Thank you. Thanks for the time and the opportunity. We're so grateful you took part of your evening to spend with us. Yeah. Casey, hell yeah, we're going to be working together a lot. <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. <laughs> well, have a great evening and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Thank